All right, uh, good afternoon to everyone. I think we've got a couple more people uh, coming into the webinar, but we'd like to get started on time. Um, my name is Paul Bittinger. I am the uh, lead and the medical director for the uh, Region 1 Regional Disaster Health Response System, or RDHRS, and really, really uh, glad to join you for our last session uh, in uh, the webinar series we put together to respond to the pediatric surge in, in patients with uh, acute respiratory illness. Uh, really, really excited uh, to have a very important topic here, which is uh, clinical decision making um, in pediatric respiratory illness uh, with respect to disposition. I'm, I'm an emergency physician myself, uh, and uh, making that decision about who can go home, who needs to go to uh, the floor of the ICU uh, is obviously one of the most important decisions we make, uh, and how we do this safely, how we recognize uh, other resources uh, that are out there to help facilitate getting the patient to the right destination. That's really, really important. And we're really thrilled uh, to have three outstanding speakers today from Hasbro Children's Hospital in Rhode Island, uh, who put together a really, really great talk. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, please. So again, I am Paul Bittinger. Uh, our three speakers uh, are Dr. Sarah Spencer Welsh, uh, who is the medical director of the pediatric ICU uh, at Hasbro. Uh, Patty Carrero, uh, who is the clinical manager for the Life Pact Critical Care Transport Team, uh, as well as uh, um, for the Express Care Transfer and Access Center. Um, and we have Dr. Uh, Siraj Amanullah, who is an Associate uh, Professor of Health Services uh, and Emergency Pediatrician um, at, uh, at Hasbro. Just three fantastic speakers. So glad that they're joining us today. Next slide, please. So um, as we've mentioned in the previous webinars, uh, the RDHRS, Regional Disaster Health Response System, is an initiative funded by the uh, US Administration for Strategic Preparedness and Response, or ASPR, uh, within the US Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, we're very grateful for their support uh, overall for our efforts, uh, both to provide education uh, to the Region 1, the New England state uh, community, um, as well as other uh, disaster planning uh, and response efforts. Uh, next slide. Uh, we, of course, have to offer the usual disclosure that the uh, content that's being presented today represents uh, the content from the individual speakers only and does not uh, reflect any official position or policy of the United States government. Um, this is not meant to uh, serve as medical device, uh, sorry, medical uh, advice uh, or guidance for treatment. Uh, and as always, uh, uh, individual patients uh, should seek uh, care from a licensed provider if they have concerns. Um, this is not specific medical advice for patients, uh, and uh, none of the presenters today has uh, any uh, conflicts of interest to disclose. Next slide. So with that, uh, I wanna get into the content as quickly as we can. Um, during the uh, presentations, uh, please do put your questions uh, in the Q&A, uh, and we'll try uh, very hard to get to them at the end of the session, uh, time permitting. Um, we do keep track of those things that are submitted to the Q&A, and we'll try and get um, answers to, to the questions that we can't get to today posted on our website. This webinar will be archived. It'll be posted on our website, which is rdhrs.org. Um, and if you have colleagues who you think might want to listen to this uh, later or any of the previous webinars that we presented, all of the webinars are still available as are the slide decks uh, from these presentations at rdhrs.org. So with that, let me turn it over to Dr. Welsh and thank you again so much for joining us. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Bittinger, and thank you so much to the RDHRS for having us. Um, we're, uh, as you saw, um, three um, colleagues from Prasbro Children's Hospital in Providence, Rhode Island, and we're really excited to talk to you about disposition, which is something that is really near and dear to all of our hearts. So, uh, you know, as I think has been true throughout the webinar series, we're going to talk about some common clinical presentations for the most frequently encountered pediatric respiratory diseases that you all have been seeing, that we've been seeing during this viral respiratory surge. And really for each of those common conditions, we're going to talk about levels of disposition, observation and close follow-up, so being able to go home from your ED or office, admission, whether when is an indication for coming to my world in the pediatric ICU, and then once they've been admitted, what is our usual discharge criteria? And then we'll give you some resources about publicly available clinical guidelines for the same conditions. Um, and if those haven't been shared yet across the webinars, they're really great resources. 
So I'm going to start off with everybody's favorite and talk about bronchiolitis. Um, again, a lot of this I know you've probably talked about in previous webinars in terms of recognizing and treating bronchiolitis, um, but doing a brief review here. So bronchiolitis is a small lower airway disease in childhood, predominantly in the under two-year-old, respiratory distress and failure. And we think about, you know, three to four major things that there's inflammation, there's obstruction um, from mucus and mucus plugging that a lot of our infants with bronchiolitis are obligate nasal breathers and that chest wall and lung dynamics in childhood have a particular impact on how this disease process comes about and the development of respiratory distress and failure, especially in the infant. Um, and a reminder that and this bronchiolitis can be secondary to any viral culprit, but obviously a lot of the work that we started talking about, um, you know, in this webinar series was because of the RSV viral surge that we saw stronger and earlier than a lot of other previous seasons um, and the rhinovirus slash enterovirus surge that had happened prior to that. And it's often especially severe in the premature and often even slightly premature. So that late preterm baby um, is a frequent culprit. Uh, so the born at 34, 35, 36, 37, even 38 weeks can sometimes be an actual predisposition to having severity, increased severity and morbidity of bronchiolitis. And then again, infants and children with neuromuscular weakness, whether that's cerebral palsy, developmental delay, motor delay, um, you know, any one of the number of children that we see that have um, issues with airway clearance and uh, chest wall strength. So here's a pretty picture of some mucus in an inflamed airway. So bronchitis, which we talk a lot about in adults, but a lot less in children would be inflammation and swelling of the bronchi. We're talking really about the small distal airways, the bronchioles, inflammation, mucus plugging, and again, some chest wall dynamics that make a difference in the severity of disease. So differential diagnosis, uh, there's going to be a number of things that you're going to see that are, you know, different in bronchiolitis, but have a lot of overlap with other respiratory disease. So wheezing and asthma with Siraj, we'll talk about a little bit later, croup, which Patty is going to talk about, and then pneumonia, which can easily happen as a secondary infection on top of bronchiolitis. Cardiac disease, uh, things that create respiratory distress or can create some respiratory noise, but aren't actually related to parenchymal pathology like vascular rings or foreign body aspiration, or again, especially in the preterm baby, but not always, um, the babies that have malacia in their airways, so floppy airways, so any um, posterior airway, posterior pharynx or airway malacia can sometimes cause that really loud, noisy breathing, but then when you listen down in the chest, has less noise there and is distinct from things that are actually a parenchymal problem. And the clinical presentation, I think you've all seen this by now. Um, so one, usually within one to three days of a viral upper respiratory infection that then gets down into the small airways, fever, cough, nasal discharge, progressing to respiratory distress, progressing to a lower respiratory tract infection and a lot of secretions from the nose, from the mouth with coughing. And then I think especially important um, that, uh, and we've I think seen a lot with the very young infants and the neonates that were really sick with RSV during this surge, um, that premature and under two month infants, sometimes their presentation cannot be respiratory distress, but just be apnea. Um, and so I think especially as we have uh, infants coming in with brief unexplained, you know, brief resolved unexplained events, um, that thinking about viral infection and bronchiolitis is really high on the list for them. You'll see persistent cough, depending again on the age of kids. Sometimes babies are not, you know, don't, don't have the chest wall strength to generate a good cough, but tachypnea, increased work of breathing, um, retractions within the intercostal spaces or subcostal spaces, some use of abdominal mus muscles, and then grunting. And you can hear a baby in particular grunting what they're trying to do when they make that. Uh, uh, uh 
noise is really generate more intrinsic airway pressure to try to stent open their airways because of the inflammation and mucus plugging there. Nasal flaring and then crackles and wheezing. Um, and just because you hear wheezing doesn't necessarily mean it's asthma. And Siraj is going to talk about things that aren't respiratory distress and aren't, aren't asthma that, you know, include wheezing. And we always tell our trainees that it sounds like Velcro, ripping apart Velcro on exam with all the bronchi and crackles that you can hear down in the chest wall and the parenchyma. But it is very different and difficult to, uh, to um, listen and hear differently from the upper airway noise of the nasal congestion and, um, and breathing. So here's a just, you know, still picture illustration of a sick baby. So things you might see, nasal flaring, um, you can get some cyanosis, some retraction, so that sucking in of skin, subcostal and intracostal. Um, and again, as you can see the bronchiole as they get more inflamed and more mucus plugged. So here's where we're gonna get into disposition um, and really thinking about how do we decide who's a baby that has mild, moderate, or severe disease, and what am I supposed to do with them when I see them in my office or ED? So, and we'll talk a little bit again, in each of these conditions, we're gonna talk about um, levels of criteria for each of those dispositions. So in mild disease, you'll see a baby that's alert, that's active, that's feeding well, and that's really important, and we'll talk about that. Um, no to minimal work of breathing and some, you can have some mild tachypnea, um, but not severely elevated. Uh, in moderate disease, which are really the people that you're, the babies that you're going to see in your EDs, in your offices, um, that it's, you know, often the classic story is a couple of days of, you know, runny nose or URI symptoms, and they've been taking fewer bottles or they've been breastfeeding less well. Um, maybe they have some decreased wet number of wet diapers because they're not feeding as well. And they might have minimal to moderate work of breathing and some increase in their tachypnea. And then severe disease, fussy and agitation. And that's something that again is hard to pick up because babies cry and babies are agitated. And of course they're agitated, they don't feel good or they have a fever, but actually that persistently agitated, persistently crying baby, sometimes that can be air hunger and that can be an important thing to pick up on. So really poor feeding and then the moderate to severe work of breathing and an increase in tachypnea. So let's talk about levels of a baby that you could send home. So um, a baby that has bronchiolitis, you've made the diagnosis and you're thinking, great, I can observe this baby for a few hours and then I can send them home with good follow-up with a pediatrician. So taking good by, you know, good PO, good feeds by mouth, um, appears hydrated on exam, making four to six wet diapers of urine a day. And a really lovely diagnostic moment is if you can watch them feed while they're with you, because a baby that is able to protect their airway, um, coordinate eating and breathe at the same time, because a lot of, you know, again, more infants are obligate nose breathing. Breathers, if they're really stuffed up, it's very hard for them to coordinate eating and breathing. So if you can watch them take oral feeds successfully, then that's a really good indication of the fact that they're going to be able to, one, keep themselves hydrated and two, clear their secretions. Certainly that they're not hypoxic. Um, and we would call hypoxia anything less than 90% on room air on your initial um, evaluation, minimal to no work of breathing and some mild tachypnea. And then of course, importantly, a reliable follow-up with vigilant families. Um, we often tell families that bronchiolitis is a roller coaster um, because it is a dynamic disease, depending on where the mucus plugging is happening, et cetera, and can often get worse before it gets better. So there are certainly patients that Siraj sees in the ED that come in and look totally okay and good for follow-up on day one of illness, but then by day four of illness, they're actually looking a lot sicker. So as long as the families know that things might get worse before they get better, we you know tell them anecdotally days four to five of having bronchiolitis or URI symptoms tend to be the worst. But you know this season has blown all of our usual criteria and advice out of the water. Um, 
And there are certainly kids that are still very sick at, you know, a week plus. Um, but that those that's really what we're looking for in the baby that we feel comfortable sending home out of the ED. So the baby that really needs to go to the wards um, and needs admission in a pediatric, you know, hospital or a place with a pediatric ward. Um, that's the baby that you've looked, you've tried to watch them take PO and uh, they're just not doing so great, or it's a lot reduced from where they were. And when you do that great diagnostic test of trying to watch them eat, you see them struggling where they're really doing a lot of pauses while they're breathing, they're coughing, they're spluttering with their feeds, um, you know, where they're just not as interested at all, because that's a really good indication that they're going to struggle with keeping hydrated at home. Um, evidence of dehydration, certainly the decreased number of wet diapers or appearing clinically dry on exam, moderate to severe work of breathing, moderate to severe tachypnea, or certainly any hypoxia or hypercarbia. Um, high flow nasal cannula is a wonderful thing. It's an adjunct that we've really taken advantage of in the past, you know, 15 to 20 years. Um, and that is giving some degree of not positive pressure, not opening up the lungs, but really doing essentially wash out so that the hypercarbia, if you have someone who's got a venous, um, you know, CO2 in the 50s, then often just initiating high flow nasal cannula can bring that down into a normal range and help a little bit with work of breathing. And then again, as we mentioned, anybody that's in the early course of disease, um, the, where any of these things are, you know, are happening and then are an indication for you, just because we know if um, the baby's small, if the baby's, you know, if this is early in their process, we're like, mm, I don't know, you're already doing some things that concern us. Maybe we should make sure that we get you admitted and that you can be more closely observed because things could get worse before they get better. So when babies with bronchiolitis come to my world, um, so really that's the severe work of breathing, work worsening hypoxia. So babies that are really needing more than 50% FiO2 to, um, to keep their, you know, hypoxia, their saturations in a normal range, that's a concern. If you're going up on your nasal cannula, you're going up on your high flow um, and really not being able to capture them. If there's worsening hypercarbia, not relieved by interventions like high flow, and then certainly if they have altered mental status. So a lot of the babies that we see and that we watch really closely for potential need for positive pressure support or intubation are the babies that have gone from being that very fussy, agitated baby to really not doing much at all. And they lie there and have severe work of breathing and they're interested in no feeds um, and they're really really sleepy, really, really sleepy. So that is a really high indication of the fact that things, again, could get worse before they get better. Um, so those are the things that tell us that you might need to be in our world um, and with potentially need for intubation. And then I put some chest x-rays here. Just, you know, again, I think um, if there's, uh, you're not used to seeing chest x-rays of babies with bronchiolitis, they can look terrible. Um, and really in comparison, if you saw an x-ray like this in an adult, you'd be like, Ooh, you are going straight to the ICU. Um, so the chest x-ray on the left of the screen has some right upper lobe atelectasis. Their the viral bronchiolitis loves to take out the right upper lobe. Um, you can really have some patchy, patchy atelectasis um, just because the airways are so small and it's so easy to do mucus plugging. And then you can see on the right of the screen, again, some perihilar markings uh, and fluffiness, but no true lobar infiltrate. Although the right upper lobe atelectasis can often get confused um, with a pneumonia or often be very hard for our radiologist to tell the difference. And so that's when you get the radiologist that tells you, you know, cannot exclude uh, infection, infiltrate, or pneumonia. 
And then discharge criteria. So again, if you have the patient in, you know, in your community hospital on the wards or in the ICU, um, when do we feel like it's comfortable to let the patient go home and circle back to that going home with close follow-up with their PCP? So no hypoxia, so greater than 90% for eight to 12 hours. We love to see them take a nap during that time. It's not, you know, not a requirement, but it's always really nice to see that they can maintain their saturations while asleep, that they can still have some work of breathing, but that it's mild, that they've returned to their baseline mental status, eating well, um, no need for what sometimes we call deep suctioning, but really like um, a, a nasopharyngeal suctioning as opposed to the front of the nares suctioning that parents can do at home, that their fever curve is improved and that their PCP is going to be following up. So all of those are the things that we say, yep, now you've circled back to the patient that we were talking about at the beginning, that you're safe to be at home and have some close follow-up with your PCP. And then again, I am sure that uh, some folks have talked about these already, um, but the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and uh, the Seattle Children's are really wonderful resources. We use them all the time. They have clinical pathways that are open to the public. And so you can just Google um, and all of their clinical pathways at both, Ch at both CHOP and Seattle Children's are open and available to you and anyone with an internet connection um, as how they separate out um, you know, levels of severity, their workup, the labs that they would send or not. There's really excellent resources on adjunct treatments um, about you know, use of bronchodilators and albuterol and all the things that you think would probably help and oftentimes don't, but sometimes do depending on how sick they are. Um, so I just put in a plug for um, CHOP's clinical pathway for bronchiolitis and then the AAP has a clinical practice guideline on the care uh, for patients for infants with bronchiolitis from 2014. And I will, with that, I'll let Patty take it away to talk about group. Thank you so much, Dr. Welsh. And as she said, we're excited to be here and present for all of you. So next slide, please. So just looking at croup and giving a general overview of what croup is. Um, so it's a viral infection of the upper respiratory tract. It mostly occurs in infants and young children between the ages of six and three. And while it can occur in children that are older, we generally see it between this, this age group. It can be caused by any viral infection, um, but generally we're seeing parrot influenza, RSV and rhinovirus are our current culprits. Um, as Dr. Welsh said, you know, kind of everything we have known in the last few years has kind of been blown out of the water with this season. Um, it consists of swelling of the larynx and trachea, as well as respiratory epithelium becomes really inflamed and edematous, making it very hard to get breaths in, which through the narrowing and creates a lot of strider, um, as well as it has re reduced mobility of the vocal cords, which results in what you'll see is when kids come in this very hoarse cry or cough, um, or even a hoarse voice as they're trying to talk to you. Next slide. So looking at our differential diagnoses, and I think with croup, one of the big things is to get a really good history when kids come in, especially in the ED, if it's the first, you know, you're walking in, is this something that just suddenly started? Is this something that's been going on for a couple of days? Much like bronchiolitis, croup gets worse on day two and day three. So it's really good to know where you are in the trajectory. Um, but there are a number of different things that can look like croup, but not necessarily our croup, and, or it can cause croup, which is bacterial tracheitis. Um, epiglottitis can also sort of mimic croup, and, croup, and while it's a little bit less that we're seeing this, especially with vaccinations, but you'll see severe, severe work of breathing, anxiety, and definitely drooling, which are telltale signs. Um, and I think the biggest thing is looking at, you know, when you're looking at history is foreign body. So is this something, you know, was the child playing earlier and then all of a sudden mom and dad notice this croup-like, you know, presentation, which would lead you more towards the foreign body aspiration versus a croup. Hemangioma, while less likely, is also a possibility, as well as peritonsal abscess, neoplasm, retropharyngeal abscess, and we definitely have to keep smoke inhalation um, and things like that in, in play. Next slide. So looking at clinical presentation with croup, it's generally a, a pretty easy telltale sign when kids come in. They have this very barky, almost they sound like a seal when they walk in, and that's sort of your first clue that you're looking at croup. Um, it's usually mild and lasts, you know, less than one week. However, symptoms do become worse at night. So if you do work in an ED, generally parents can sort of ride out the day thinking this is just a general cold. Then they put, you know, their, their child down to sleep and they awake at two in the morning with this really harsh, 
you know, extreme barky cough um, that can be really concerning, very hard to get air in. So you generally see patients presenting at night versus during the day. It can also um, consist of a fever as well as dehydration. If, if there's a lot of swelling going on, kids are, aren't able to take in enough fluids and they become easily dehydrated. Next slide. So here's just a great picture to just show the differences between, as you can see, the lumen is nice and open if you don't have any kind of um, airway issue going on in the healthy airway, air is able, able to get through fairly quickly. But then if you add a viral infection, we see some swelling of the thickened muscles. Um, and then we start to get a narrowing, which creates that sort of barky cough. Next slide. And then just looking at our vocal cords, same here. If you look at the normal larynx, you know, vocal cords are nice and, and open. And then we get those swelling of the vocal cords, which starts to produce that sort of hoarse cough and as well as that hoarse cry. So when do we decide that we're gonna, you know, observe a patient versus admit a patient? Um, again, as we said, parents generally show up at night. They can generally ride out that, that first day pretty well, sometimes into day two. Um, anyone who has, you know, children, you've probably spent at least one night with your child with group, you know, sitting in your bathroom floor with the, the shower going, trying to get that air in. So most parents can kind of ride out that first day and they'll sort of present on day two. Um, so if we're looking at and we, and parent, uh, patients have come into the ED, we look to make sure that they have no strider at rest that they're in normal mentating, that they have a normal mental status, that there's no hypoxia. And as Dr. Welsh said, we look for anything that's, you know, under 90 as being hypoxic. We want to make sure that they, we do give them therapies such as racemic epi, which helps to smooth out those muscles and, and dilate the airway to get air in, that we watch them for at least four hours to make sure there's no rebound effect, because as we know that these medications only last for a certain amount of time. And after four hours, we'll suddenly see a child that looks great, suddenly start, you know, striderous and, and being in distress again. And we wanna make sure as Dr. Welsh says, we have really good PCP follow-up and that is established and we have a good plan of care in order to send those patients home. Next slide. So looking at when do we wanna admit a patient? Well, if they're at rest and we're still seeing them striderous, if they're crying and they're striders, if mom and dad can sort of their caretaker can calm them down and we don't see strider, that's a good sign. However, if mom and dad get them calm and then we still see strider, then we're gonna think about we need to admit that patient. If we have any kind of rebound symptoms after we've given Racemic epi, we definitely want to look at admitting that patient. Any kind of increased work of breathing, any change in mental status, are they agitated? Do they look anxious? Do they look air hungry? Are they very restless? Which will all tell us that they need a little bit more monitoring. And then if we have to give multiple doses of racemic epi, if we've given one and the child looks great after four hours, or if we've had to sort of space them close together and we can't space them out, we'd want to consider admission. Next slide. So when do we decide to send them to Saris? scope of the world. Well, if we have to give multiple rounds of racemic epi and we're, we're putting them closer and closer together, then we definitely want to think that pinky was more of the option. Need for more frequent steroid dosing. Is there significant work of breathing? Are we starting to see retractions? Are we starting to see flaring? Are we starting to see increased coughing? Hypoxia. A lot of times we'll use Heliox in, those, in these patients. It's a lower dense gas mixture. It's easier to get in. It's easier for patients to inhale. We'll go with an 80-20 or a 70-30 mix is generally what it's mixed. And that's 80% heliox with 20, helium, excuse me, with 20% oxygen. Makes it much easier to get air in and, and get patients ox oxygenated. And then if they're hypercarbic, we definitely want to send them up to the piggy for closer monitoring. Next slide. And this is just an x-ray showing steeple signs. So this is a, a really clear way to tell whether you're dealing with group or something different. And thank you, Dr. Wells, for showing where that, where that sign is. And you can see there's a lot of narrowing at the top and it's called a steeple sign because it sort of resembles a, a church steeple and that's where it gets its name from. Next slide. So now we've admitted our patient and we're thinking we need to send the patient home. So how do we decide that it's time for, the, for our patients to come home? Well, we wanna make sure they have no strider at rest. We wanna make sure that you're able to discharge them with any additional doses of dexamethasone if they need them. We wanna make sure that they're not hypoxic, that they've returned to their normal mental status, that they're feeding well. And as, as Dr. Welsh said, you really wanna watch you know, these patients, making sure that they can swallow okay, that they're able to maybe take a bottle without any kind of respiratory distress. And follow-up is key. We wanna make sure that there is good follow-up, that our patients are connected to their pediatricians and that they have a, a plan in place when they leave slide. And then as Dr. Welch said, here are our, our references. CHOP and Seattle Children's are, are great references. We utilize them, as Dr. Welch said, multiple times in, in a lot of different areas. Um, and so great references for all of you to use. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Faraj for asthma.
Thank you, Patty. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everybody, for having us over. My apologies. My voice is, is gone, probably because of all the viruses that we just talked about. I got it all together, and now I'm in the last phases of that. And saying that when our patients come to the ER, we love what Patty was talking about, Coop, because there is instant gratification. Most of the time, the arrival and the pathway towards the ER or any healthcare facility is creating the disposition by itself. And we know which direction the patient is going to go. Then, of course, I love asthma because most of the time, if a patient is coming with asthma, I may be able to get them home early, majority of them within six to eight hours, very rarely overnight ER kind of like observation and extremely rarely in today's day and age with so much uh, advances in asthma management, unlikely to be in the ICU. And the last one is bronchiolitis when the patients are staring at us and the families and we stare back at the families and we just like are looking at each other. Okay, all right. You know, like this is going to be a long pathway and we will see each other quite often. So I call them as a revolving door illness. And I, whenever I'm sending them home, I talk to them. Huh, I'll see you again. One of these days again within the next 24 hours, maybe. So here what it is. So unfortunately, you know, like bronchiolitis is one of the worst that was Sarah talked about. So I'll talk about asthma and you know, like, and uh, take it further. Uh, so just pathophysiologically, what is asthma, reactive airway disease? You know, like we know the symptoms are very classic of coughing, wheezing, shortness of breath. When it's in the younger patient, it's a combination of what we call as a bronchial asthma or bronchiolitis asthma or other names of crupolitis asthma, all these different symptoms comes in. So that's where the more dilemma comes in. But on the old, in the summertime, you know, like mostly when there's an allergic reasons and not viral reasons, we basically have like more a reversible cause of this bronchospasm. Asthma is happening because of bronchial inflammation and a spasm. So anything can cause bronchial inflammation. It could be a viral, an allergen, or any other reason. It could be cold air also. So that is basically one thing to keep in mind. And the agent is going to decide whether are you going to make a complete difference in the lung sounds or not. Because the thing is going to be there and is landing in your lung for more than five days like an uninvited guest is not going to disappear. So you might have some improvement, but then after that, the improvement may not be as classic as we regularly see with an allergic asthma, for example. And that brings us to the next time of as status asthmaticus. And status asthmaticus is someone which basically requiring so much bronchodilator treatment continuously, you know, like that it is basically beyond certain, you know, like that it's not resolving at all. So that's where the symptoms are compromising, you know, like your mental status and everything. Uh, we are seeing an increased frequency of wheezing, you know, like with URI and bronchiolitis. And that's where, you know, like the whole surge is happening, you know, like all these patients are grouped together and they are all coming in and our ER is inundated because of that. So next slide, please. As we talked about, it's an increased inflammation of the lower airway. Croup was the upper airway. Bronchiolitis is bronchioles. It's kind of like in between. The airway is irritable, and it's basically causing bronchospastic sounds. There's overproduction of mucus, and that's why the child is going to cough more to basically clear up this mucus. The mucosal edema is going to be one of the reasons that is basically affecting the air oxygenation, and that's why they're going to be tachypneic. They're going to be grunting. They're trying to breathe more and faster to basically get this oxygen to all the cells which is needed. The airway obstruction you know, like a bronchoconstriction, and then after that, it can evolve into mechanical obstruction if not picked up at the right time. I will talk about the sick asthmatics, and that's where the most dilemma is. These silent sick asthmatics are going to be someone who can basically be very severe. And sadly, you know, like every winter, every summer, we see a child pass away because of unrecognized asthma exacerbation. Most recently, as like three weeks ago, we had a sad uh, passing away of a child because of asthma. Next slide. So. Differential diagnosis, of course, with asthma is pneumonia. You know, like, are you having asthma symptoms or are you having a virus or bacteria having associated, you know, like wheezing and rals and ronchis? Uh, of course, foreign body aspiration, you know, like an, a child who is not talking and a child who is basically like two or three years old, and this is basically a sudden onset of breathing difficulty, should always think about foreign body. Of course, cardiogenic pulmonary edema can also present with wheezing and rals and ronchi. The location is going to be more lower, uh, lower lung fields. So keeping that thing in mind, every now and then we have bronchiolitis. Patients come in, which are just triggered, but they have a baseline cardiac pathology, which was not picked up. And then you basically find out, oh, this was a co-op. And now this is having bronchiolitis with that. Oh, this is this thing. And now there's now asthma symptoms associated with that. The anatomic lesions, which could be fixed, like airway web, hemangiomas, or trachea you know, like which can also present as asthma symptoms. Of course, it's a good point to ask the child and the family about the history. You know, most of the young babies who have, are premature, you know, like they could have bronchopamy dysplasia. They have a whole course of illness in the past, which is going to teach you how they can react right now with your condition. So keep that thing in mind also. So the BPD patients will act something different. However, they may need a different management strategies also. 
uh, vocal cord paralysis or vocal cord dysfunction. A teenager suddenly coming in and having these upper ear, <laughs> these kind of symptoms and signs, and you're trying to give the bronchodilators and nothing happening. Think about the vocal cord dysfunction and occasionally vocal cord paralysis can present in the same way. Uh, not all tachypnea and pediatric patients is respiratory. Every now and then, bronchiolitis and asthma patients, and you are going to dig more and listen to more and probably have a little bit more time to sit with them, you might pick up something else. Commonest thing is going to be DKA. Whenever the viruses are happening, this DKA surges happen. You know, with COVID, with influenza, with everything, we basically see all these patients. Even yesterday, last night, I was working, and I had a patient, you know, like who basically had was presenting with like cough and any nose and pneumonia, influenza-like symptoms, but actually had DKA. You know, like and came in like with a pH of seven point oh five. You know, so that's one of the things to keep in mind that there is going to be some illness which is going to trigger, especially DKA in our population, and that's going to be that's going to just require a little bit more observation, a little bit more looking that this breathing is something different. This is not just bronchiolitis acting. And the time spent with the patient is going to give you these rare diagnoses. Of course, toxidromes and injections can also present with tachypnea and wheezing symptoms, you know, like we're going to frustrate poisoning, other things like that. So keep that thing in mind. Undiagnosed non-cyanotic congenital heart disease, while we talk about that, you know, like for example, a coat, which is mild, could also be missed. And then basically with the viral infection can present Intrinsic or secondary to cardiac malformations, the airway malformations can also present, and these are the differentials to keep in mind. Very easy to list, difficult to pick, so have to keep in the mind, examine them again. When they are going home, like what Sarah said, if the young babies feed, if the older children, can they talk, can they laugh, can they basically finish a sentence, can they give me a thumbs up, can they basically watch something on the TV and tell me what they were watching about, all these things and a good exam and always feel the femoral pulses, I think so we will be good. So response and observation and follow-up. What is your intervention? And as we are talking about this search and patients sitting in our ER, if we can create a pathway in our ER at the triage, if you can diagnose this is possibly an asthma, you start the treatment at that point, it is going to decrease the time of your observation. So sometimes these kids are sadly sitting for two hours, three hours, four hours, and then the management started. It's going to be fine because there's so much we can do. But I think so we are at a, at a crux of this disaster that in which we need to basically create pathways in any hospital, in any setting in which we start the asthma management as the child is basically hitting the door because that's where we talked about remember four to six hours most of these kids are going to be fine you start the management you will have a disposition in your hand hopefully you know like when the time the child is going to be properly seen so bronchodilators and immediate administration of systemic steroids your benchmark should be if a bronchodilator is making a difference then how fast you should add the systemic steroid in the treatment because the earlier you're going to give the earlier the, the treatment is going to start we recommend decadron because it is a faster onset of action so you will see an impact in one or two hours and surprisingly, just think in your mind, oh, this patient I gave Decadron two hours later, and he got better two hours later after that. This patient I gave at the arrival, and two hours later better. And that's how you will learn that how fast the Decadron can make, a, can make an Im impact on your disposition from your ER not requiring bronchodilators more frequently than four hours. And that's what we usually do. If you are requiring two bronchodilator treatments, observe for two more hours. If you're requiring three bronchodilator treatments, observe for two hours and push it for three hours, you know, like try to space them to three hours. If you're requiring one bronchodilator treatment within one and one and a half hours, you may decide to send them home. So one will be one to one and a half hours, two treatments, at least observe after the second treatment for two more hours. And if there are three treatments are given, then at least think about giving another treatment in two hours and try to space them to three to four hours after that. And that category usually helps, you know, like even my learners and even myself to keep in my mind, to keep on going back to listening to these patients and then deciding, okay, you're looking good. I can send you home. And this is going to be what we're going to do to get you home. Improved air entry and wheezing, of course, there is a tricky part of it. Some of the chronic asthma patients may not completely clear their lungs and you have to decide with the family what is going to be the better work of breathing for them. Most of the families who have chronic asthma patients are very smart. Sometimes I feel like more smart than me and they exactly know what their child can sustain. And so that's going to be a sheer decision-making is going to be helpful. Definitely no hypoxia. So what is a hypoxia? What do you basically tolerate? 91 to 92% due to the VQ mismatch after giving the treatment is, is reasonable. And that's where you want to not have them below 90% before they're going home. 92 to 90% is an acceptable number to go home. Above 95% is going to be something that you would like them to be at. Mild tachypnea, as we notice, is reasonable. And some of the families can do back-to-back -back treatments like every two hours to every three hours over the next eight hours. And then after that, they can basically pass on to the pathway every four hours for 24 hours, and then every four hours as needed. 
no work or breathing. That means that the child who is not speaking is not speaking a ton. Make them walk around, you know, like in your ER and see whether they became out of breath. Listen to them before and after the walk, and that's going to be helpful too. An appropriate follow-up in place is really important. Either it's going to be you or it is going to be somebody in the community. They, they, you have to tell them what is important to be done. And you'll be surprised how often families don't realize that follow-up is so important for these patients. Um, and then accordingly, follow a plan with a follow-up medication plan. Do you going to repeat the steroids in 24 hours, 48 hours, or 72 hours? And how you're going to prescribe that a steroid is going to be important too. Next slide, please. So acuity of the symptoms, presence of fever, upper respiratory symptoms, exposure to allergens is what is going to be in the history, family history of asthma, first time wheezing patients can always present with the past history of wheezing that was not recognized, or there's strong family history like siblings have asthma, parents have asthma, allergies or eczema. Eczema, allergies, asthma go together as a triage, as we all know. But the red flags are going to be when you're asking them, and always I ask my also medical students and the people taking this story, is there a past ICU admission? Did the patient require BAPEV in the past? Is there a history of intubation? Definitely. That puts me more, you aren't going home till you look 100% better for me, because this history is very significant for me. And I will drag my feet for them to be sitting with me for 10 hours, 12 hours. It's not necessary that if you have this to be admitted, but if we have this history, you have to make sure that you have at least a space them every four hours, couple of times, and they are looking 100% great, you know, before I'm going to send them out. And frequent emergency room visits is also going to be should be considered either because of asthma or because of lack of follow up or because of lack of understanding of the medical process itself. Hypoxia, of course, will need an admission, needs bronchodilators more frequently, for example, every two hours or every one hour, or need of continuous albuterol. Remember, the continuous albuterol could be used for four hours. So if you're in a facility and you are taking care and now you're doing continuous albuterol, that should not be the stop sign for you to try to transfer them somewhere else, because in the next two hours, by the time your stairs are kicking, you might not need continuous albuterol. And that's where, for my job is that in the ER, I talk to our own community providers, and sometimes they basically call me and we make a shared decision plan also. Okay, you are this patient, you want to try over the next four, six hours, it will save them a trip to my ER, save them your trip to basically come to here, and then we can take it from there. And most of the community providers easily will basically, you know, like work as a shared decision model making with us. Lack of significant improvement in response intervention, of course, is going to be a sign of you have done everything. You have basically thrown everything in your hand. You can give them mag, you can begin IV fluids, you're giving them continuous cell butyrol, you're giving IV decadron. You are thinking, okay, what else can I do? Do I basically do nasal CPAP? Do I basically do BiPAP? Do I do other things? Of course, that's a decision of, made, of admissions. And those kids who are just not going to drink, you know, like younger kids, you know, like they're just not drinking. You can't send them a dehydration. They have sticky lungs. You want to give them fluids. If they can't drink, the sticky lungs will become more stickier at home. So that's why kind of thinking about it. Okay, we need fluid, so we are stuck with that. Next slide, please. And the PICU is going to be our lifeline. As I, I was talking earlier that we are in a system in which starting from the triage, I have a pathway. I have my friends upstairs who can basically take them to pick you. Not everybody has that luxury. And that's where, you know, like the decision has to be made. Is this patient who is being sent to your referral center can directly go to the ER or should directly go to the PICU and bypass the ER because we will have our transport team come and pick up sick asthmatics so that our paramedics and other providers, you know, like are not stuck in a situation in which they might have to intubate somebody in the scene. Requiring bronchodilators more frequently than two hours, lack of response to any intervention, lethargy, altered mental status. And that's where I have seen that any asthma, you're putting an IV, try to get a VBG or try to get an ISTAT. And that's where it's going to help you. What is the pH and what is the PCO2? And I'll come to the PCO2 in a second. A silent chest. Why is the lung not moving? You're, you're asthmatic, you are tight. And that basically makes you worry about, is it because you're so tight that you can't even say, and this is going to be a teenager group, or you basically will have an hemothorax. Paradoxical thoracic abdominal breathing in younger kids, like, you know, like, why is abdomen coming out when you're basically sucking it in? So that's going to be one thing to keep in mind that that basically means your diaphragm is getting tired. Severe dyspnea or inability to phonate, cannot talk, of course, is always worrisome. And the child is basically shaking the hands to the mom, I need the remote, but cannot say I want the remote. That's basically one child that I will kind of like worry about. Altered mental status, agitation, poor perfusion, and tachycardia can be signs of hypercardia. The same signs can happen if you're going to give somebody continuous albuterol. And remember, continuous albuterol, if given and is taken too much, can cause significant lactic acidosis. And you have a sudden asthma person who she was talking and now not talking. Keep in mind, that could be because of albuterol toxicity also. So just keep that thing in mind when you're giving different kind of administration for albuterol. It can happen because of that, or it can be happening because of your hypercarbia. So if you are breathing really fast, you should blow out your CO2. 
if you are so tight and you aren't able to blow out your CO2, that means that you are in trouble. So if you are having low CO2, the PCO2 in your Venus, that's great. Anything under the 40 is going to be, I love that. But if it's going to be 50, I'm a little bit worried. Goes to 60, that is a kid I would do another eye study in the next you know, like hour or so. Because why you are 60? Because you cannot, you're getting tired. And that's where our gases are going to be very helpful. And also for our, I see you, you know, like friends, because when they are accessing this, you know, like when they are seeing this patient, accepting these patients, then they know, okay, this is going to be a sicker asthmatic. We don't want to intubate an asthma child. It's the most difficult intubation. It's the most difficult to vent such patients. We want to basically block this particular pathway so that they don't require intubation. And that's where, you know, like these numbers are going to be helpful. So if you see a normal cardia, Give a second to this child. There's something which is needs to be done for this because a normal cardia is not a good sign in a severe asthmatic, and it could be ominous as we are talking about. So giving you hyperinflation, straightforward, use lungs. Not every asthmatic should have a chest X-ray. You will basically do that thing. If it's a, somebody with a chest pain, somebody who's not improving, silent chest, then you're going to do such an X-ray to decide, is it hyperinflated or, our next slide, or is this subcutaneous emphysema? Not everybody will have crunchiness on the lungs and palpation, but when you see them, it's going to be there. An acute, tight, chest, silent lung, you know, like can have, uh, as we talked about subcutaneous emphysema, or you can have also suddenly a pneumothorax being also popped up because of the tight lung. And an acute change in asthmatic child, either as I talked about medication, or they can basically have popped the pneumothorax also. So that's why I keep that thing in mind also, that any severe changes suddenly in a child who's doing otherwise okay should basically merit an X-ray just to figure it out why the changes happen. So tolerating bronchodilators every four hours time too, you can get home, no hypoxia, no work of breathing, taking good PO, follow a plan in place and make sure that they will have a steroid dose either in the next 24 hours or 48 hours, or even 72 hours because Decadon is good for three days, but we do it 24 hours if you're within the hospital so people don't have enough time to go and pick it up. We do it in 48 hours for people who can basically go the next day so that they can pick up the medication. It is given in form of a tablet, ask them to crush it, mix it with some kind of like a sweet liquid, give them maybe like a small cup and then give it to them. And that's basically how it's going to be done. Oil only very rarely, I have insurance companies give a hard time that they do not cover Decadron. And, you know, like it's the most cheapest drug. If they don't cover, think about Godarex and other things, you know, like because they're basically cheaper in that way. And our pathways, again, we, we will basically recommend you to see Seattle Children's, a CHOP pathway. I know these are, these are basically open to public, so that's great. We also have our own pathways, but they're not open to public. So that's why we are referring everybody to these pathways. You can easily access them. And I think so, you, you know, like we all learn. I also sometimes, you know, like pick up these pathways, open it up to basically help with our patients too. So I'll give it back now to Sarah because of the influenza surge. She's going to just talk very briefly about, you know, like flu and how we basically can get out of this mess. Thanks, Suraj. So yeah, we're not, I'm not going to go through all of the same things on influenza just because influenza can do all of the things that we just talked about, including pneumonia. Um, but because we are seeing influenza being so much on the rise, I, I didn't think it would be appropriate for us to finish out this webinar series without talking about the flu. Um, so remember that flu could be the viral culprit in any one of these clinical presentations. Um, and when you're thinking about flu, when you're thinking about a patient who's positive for flu and has respiratory distress, has any asymmetry in their lung exam, while viral pneumonia is absolutely a thing, the flu loves to get secondary bac uh, bacterial pneumonia um, and really are patients that should be treated for community acquired pneumonia if they have an infiltrate on their chest X-ray. The other thing that flu really loves to do when there's a secondary bacterial infection is loves for MRSA to be there. Um, you know, MRSA is so predominant in our community. So when I'm seeing somebody, obviously I have a, you know, um, predisposition to be worried about somebody because I'm seeing them in the ICU. I already know that they're sick. Um, but when I'm seeing somebody positive for flu in the ICU, I'm asking questions that the parents are like, heck are you talking about where I go in and I say, have you ever had an abscess before? Um, have you, you know, has anyone in your family have abscesses? Have you ever been tested for something called MRSA? Have you ever heard about something called MRSA? And a lot of the times the parents would be like, oh yeah, I did bleach baths for them when they were a kid. Or, oh, I get these like abscesses under my armpits all the time. And when you're thinking about that and you have bacterial pneumonia in a um, patient that's positive for flu, 
you're going to want to think about MRSA coverage in your antibiotics that you're choosing. And then kids under five years old with flu are definitely at higher risk for requiring admission. All the same criteria should be in place out of all the things that we talked about. Obviously, the flu is just a virus. They can, it can create any one of those clinical presentations. Um, and then I just reference this because, you know, the recommendations have gone and the culture about Tamiflu has gone back and forth so much over the course of the past 10 years. You know, when I was in my fellowship, we were given Tamiflu to everybody who walked in the door. And then really we weren't as much because there was so much data that said, maybe it's not as effective if you don't get it in within the first 48 to 72 hours of infection and kids hate it and it makes their stomach upset and then they puke and all of those things. Um, so just so that there's rec there's data out there and recommendations from the AAP in this viral surge, we should be treating. Um, and there's recommendations straight from the AAP on the website, the American Academy of Pediatricians of Pediatrics, that antiviral treatment, which is really Tamiflu, um, there are other anti-flu treatments, antiviral treatments, but really Tamiflu is the one that we have um, for basically any high-risk kid. And high-risk basically means if you get hospitalized for any one of these clinical syndromes and you have the flu, then you should have an antiviral treatment. Anyone with severe, complicated, or progressive flu, and then high-risk patients, and when we say high-risk patients, that really means our patients with immunocompromised conditions for any reason, our sickle cell, uh, cancer, um, neuromuscular disorders, et cetera, any one of those patients, uh, be prepared that it is tough on the stomach. It's definitely tough on the stomach. That's one of the reasons that, um, you know, it, it kind of fell out of favor, but it doesn't, we really don't say that it has to be within 48 to 72 hours of symptom onset anymore. Again, if you're meeting those criteria, there's data that shows that even sometimes ventilator days can be decreased, hospital days can be decreased with Tamiflu. So if you're meeting that criteria that you're hospitalized or have severe risk, just start it even if they're five days into having the flu. Um, you know, there are other, like I said, there are other anti-flu, antiviral treatments that uh, are reportedly less tough on the stomach. Um, so we're keeping an eye out for, for those treatments and seeing how we can help get those into the public sphere. And then just, I give you a, a link here for the AAP uh, updates with this current surge in flu. And I think we will stop there. And we've still got a few minutes. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you so much to all, all three of you. That really was, was phenomenal content. Really, really helpful. Uh, one one uh, small comment on the on the Tamiflu in in, uh, in kids or anyone, uh, as many of you know, outpatient pharmacies across New England right now are, are experiencing shortages. And so if you're going to be prescribing it in the outpatient environment, just make sure you alert families and, and, and let them know there, there may be some effort on the inpatient side. Uh, for, for those that are getting hospitalized, mostly our hospital pharmacies, I'm understanding, uh, are still able to access it without, without difficulty, which is good news. Um, there, there are a couple of questions. Uh, we've got about six minutes left. Uh, maybe, Patty, I might start with you. We've got a, a few different questions about um, epinephrine, um, especially some of our EMS providers we have heard have had uh, difficulty across the country getting access to uh, racemic epi. And the question is uh, about uh, trying to, to come up with an alternative with regular epinephrine in, in the transport setting or in other settings if you can't get racemic? Um, I'm not entirely sure if you, and I see the question, if you can nebulize regular epi, and I don't know if Dr. Welsh or Dr. Amadillo know that. I'm not sure if you can nebulize regular epi, but I, I can definitely find out and follow up. It's a great question. And I know that our ambulance providers are definitely struggling nationwide with getting, um, especially with a lot of the shortages. Yeah. So I can understand the question and I, I can get that answer for him. No, no, no worries at all. Wait, sorry, Dr. Welsh, you want to comment or? Yeah, I, don't, I actually don't know the answer either. Um, certainly we've given sub-Q epi in the asthmatic or, you know, our usual rounds of, of epi for, um, 
you know, a patient in anaphylaxis who also has Strider. So I think before I went to nebulizing epi, straight epi for croup, I think I'd probably go those sub Q or IM routes like we would for anaphylaxis or asthma with epi. Um, but it's a great question. Obviously, like, you know, back in the day or in a, in a terrible situation, sometimes we put code dose epi down an endotracheal tube just to like get it, you know, absorbed by the mucosa. But, um, you know, I think the, the, the reason racemic is so beneficial is in its nebulized form. Um, but, you know, epi is epi and it'll help. Excellent. Thank, thank you so much uh, for that. Let me, uh, maybe Dr. Wells turn to you for the, the next question, which is, uh, just the discussion of heart rate uh, and, you know, specific to epi, but we also talked about albuterol toxicity. So with, with all, all the sympathomimetic agents that we're using, can you just talk about where you do or don't get concerned as, uh, as you see tachycardia? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and it's really age dependent. You know, a an infant who has a normal heart rate in the 110 to 170 range, I'm gonna be less concerned when I give them albuterol and their heart rate is 190, um, as opposed to you know, a toddler or a teenager whose regular heart rate, you know, teenager's heart rate is in the 60s to 80s and they've got a heart rate of 190, that would be really bad. Um, so I think that it's a great question. I'd say, you know, above range for age range, um, at least which should be an easily Googleable thing, um, would be something to keep an eye on. Um, and like Siraj talked about, albuterol toxicity is really something you're going to see in the persistent metabolic acidosis, persistent lactic acidosis, poor perfusion in the patient that's had a lot of albuterol. Um, although we did have a case recently where we really were like, I don't really think they got that much albuterol. Um, so keeping an eye out for that, I think is a great idea. So it, it's not as much a straightforward answer, but I think um, keeping an eye out for above age range of normal, above the high end of normal is a good idea. No, perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, and me, uh, Dr. Amanul, if I can ask you a, a question, you know, we. You've all talked a bit about the need for reassessment of the patient and, and sort of looking at their trajectory, especially in the emergency department uh, environment. A lot of kids will come in in sort of the afternoon, evening hours, and after they've been with us for four, six, eight, eight hours, they're they're getting pretty tired. And it's hard to tell sometimes is that their respiratory status or is it the fact that it's two a.m. Mm -hmm. um, I know this is a really hard answer, but can you just comment on how you're assessing who's fatiguing versus who's fatiguing uh, when you're looking at, at patients in front of you? I usually like when they yawn. If they are yawning, at least they're not fatiguing because of the respiratory effects. So that usually helps me out. But suddenly you're right. You're basically coming for an overnight shift and somebody said, oh, the treatment was done at 11. Now you're basically going to see when one and you one in there and everybody's snoring in the room. And now what do you do? So a sleeping child is always a good child because now you can assess it. Even for the bronchiolitis to the teenagers because it gives me how the lung, especially for the bronchiolitis babies, like what Sarah was saying, she would like to have the feeding child assess. I like the bronchiolitic young babies to be sleeping so I can also see that how they are breathing. Yeah. So if they are breathing, you know, like if they don't have a work or breathing, you will have to wake the child up and you have to have a certain conversation, especially if they can talk to you. How are you feeling? What's going on? The parents will like that too. So if they are, if, I think so that's going to be good enough. If really, really the child is not waking up because they sleep or not, I have put sometimes anti-adult CO2 monitor to see what's going on with that. And that basically has helped me while they're sleeping because some of the kids just snore and they're just not going to wake up. So I think so after that, that's always, you know, like a, one of the dilemmas, you know, like and how to basically do it the right way. Um, but this is how I sometimes do it. But as I said, if the child is yawning, I'm happy. So that means me like they're not like fatigued mentally. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's that's a fantastic answer. I. Paradoxically, love it when kids are really, uh, really angry with me when I wake them up in the middle of the night as well. But uh, yes, ab absolutely right. Um, excellent. Well, so two, two last quick things. Uh, we do see a comment from uh, one of our uh, New Hampshire uh, residents that in the New Hampshire EMS protocols, there's uh, regular epi in the, in the nebulizer and it works well. So thank you for that. Um, there, there's one last question about crisis standards of care. And I guess I'll make a, a, a broad comment, which is, uh, you know, in general, whenever we talk about crisis standards of care, it should be. As, as broadly based as possible, at least institutional, if not regional statewide. Uh, and so um, I think when we talk about triggers, uh, and obviously we've just been through a period of extraordinary difficulty accessing inpatient pediatric, inpatient pediatric ICU units across all of New England and, and really across much of the US. Um, 
it should always, I think, be done in consultation with the institutional leadership, ideally the healthcare coalition, uh, sort of assuring that we really have tapped every resource. And then as we adjust admission protocols or, or adjust transfer protocols, it's being done on a region-wide basis. Uh, and, and that way we, you know, we, we're, 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 we, we have confidence that we're doing what we do because there just isn't uh, another resource out there. So um, we are at time. I, I am so incredibly grateful to our speakers. Uh, in the chat, uh, there is a web link uh, to the survey. There's also the big fancy QR code here that folks can scan with their phone. Um, we really do appreciate everyone's feedback. This is our last lecture in this series, uh, but our goal as the RDHRS is always to be able to uh, mobilize and deliver content uh, depending on what the challenges are that we're facing. So your feedback, uh, letting us know how, how we can better meet your needs going forward, or if you wanna suggest um, uh, other seminar topics that would be useful to you in your emergency planning, we'd love to hear it. So uh, to Sarah, Patty, uh, Siraj, thank you so very, very much. Really appreciate it. I wish everybody a, a very happy holiday season and, uh, and a healthy new year. Thank you all. Thank you, Paul. I'll just add one more thing about uh, technical issue. I have been prescribing Biloxover, which is one-time dose, you know, like in pediatric patients is available. It does say the new studies that within 48 hours, but that's something to keep in mind that if you have, and it's also available, you know, like in outside pharmacies, you know, like sometimes more readily than Tamiflu. So if somebody's like really stuck and want to use it on a child who has a congenital heart disease, some other issues, just keep that thing in mind. But really appreciate having us over. Thank you so much. And for other people, our emails are in the system. If there's any other questions we can answer, you know, like after that offline, please do reach out to us. Excellent. Thank you again. Thank you all so much. Happy holidays. So much. Happy, Happy holidays. holidays.